Today we're going to continue the discussion of the last two weeks. The, you remember in the first week, uh, I try to give you a general introduction to the philosophy of film as I see it. And uh, we watched a film by Jean Cocteau called Beauty and the Beast. I chose Beauty and the Beast uh, because in some ways it is the archetype of what Cocteau calls the poetry of, uh, of film. He uses that phrase to describe his aesthetics to apply to all films in the nature of film, how it is inherently poetic, but it applies to his own films more than I think many others, perhaps mo more than any others, uh, since it's always the view of a poet, which he was, and uh, his using film as a poetic medium, which most people don't try to do. This cuts across what you've been reading, because remember the, the uh, burden of reality transform is the distinction between formalists and realists. And here the question is, can one art uh, approximate another? Uh, and is it in the nature of that art, the film art, to be poetic, and what does that imply? I'll come back to this um, later on today and later on in the course. The, um, we discussed the distinction, uh, particularly um, last time, between, uh, from your point of view, be, uh, between the realist and the formalist schools, and I try to prepare you for the ending of that book by saying my attempt is, true, in true philosophical manner, um, to um, attack everybody else, and then to reconstruct the, pic the um, pieces for myself. Uh, saying that, I'm reminded of something that William James said. Do any of you know who he was? Your generation doesn't seem to. He was a very important American philosopher who died about 1910, and who was very famous at, uh, professor at Harvard, and who's still important at Harvard um, for in various disciplines. Well, the reason I give this anecdote is that in uh, 1905, he was at a peace conference, I think in Japan, and uh, he addressed the assembly of delegates from different countries as follows. He said, uh, I am only a philosopher, which is to say, someone who has been trained to attack all the other philosophers. Uh, and it's in that vein that I spoke of attacking everybody else for the sake of reconstructing uh, this, the different positions in my own way and making myself available to the attack of anybody who wants to go to the trouble. Uh, in the synthesis, I try to overcome the difference between appearance, uh, between the realist and the formalist position, as well as other um, alternates within comparable distinctions, uh, particularly the distinction between appearance and reality. It's not the same distinction, but it's the same sort of attitude that makes people feel a split of that sort. Uh, that's the reason, that's what you've been reading, and that's the reason why I wanted to, you to watch uh, Woody Allen's uh, movie, The Purple Rose of Cairo, that Emily's going to talk about having watched the movie, right? Uh, this, that itself raises an issue. Um, you, you're, you're going to be watching the movie today, and that assumes that you haven't seen it or haven't watched it recently. Yet the person who presents has to in order to be able to say interesting things about it. But I would like your opinion before we go any further whether that is not a desirable procedure. Would you prefer to see these movies before you read about them and had a discussion of them or um, leave the discussion for the next week after you've seen the movie? Would, should we continue as we are? scheduled to do so on the uh, on the curriculum on the syllabus 
or should we reverse it? Um, uh, yes, go ahead, Alvin. Um, I think it might be useful to do a little bit of both. Say some things about the movie before seeing it, and then analyze it after seeing it as well. Right. Yeah, um, I'm more prepared on the uh, Citizen Kane. Well, I like did some books. That's but, that's all right. Yeah. But you haven't seen the I Purple mean, Rose of Cairo. It, you haven't yeah. seen it, um, but you will. Your discussion is on Citizen Kane, which is very valuable. Yeah, but I also. I mean, there's plenty, to, plenty to say. Um, well, for next week. Why don't we have the, whoever gives the, the presentation do both so we'll catch up? Um, what is it that you watch next week? Death in Venice. Oh, no, there, the trouble with Death in Venice is that it's so long that uh, uh, there isn't much time for discussion. Uh, there'll be maybe a half hour, and it would help. No, I know what it is. The person who. Um, turn it is next week can make just a few comments about Death in Venice because uh, there isn't going to be much time to do to catch up but devote the, that half hour to a discussion of the Purple Rose of Cairo and then we'll see next time what to do about Death in Venice. Is that alright? Is that acceptable? Uh, the reason that I wanted to have you watched Citizen Kane is because it's impossible to organize the reading uh, on Wells, Hitchcock, and Renoir in, in a way, such a way that they each get their own segment of the course. Uh, so that Wells is short changed a little at the end, but um, we, you have a preliminary in Citizen Kane. So also, Citizen Kane is such a remarkable, remarkably well-received movie by everybody except for Orson Welles, who didn't say it was not a good movie, but he already saw some of the shortcomings. Uh, like any creative artist, he was always thinking ahead for, to what he could do that would be better. Uh, and from that point of view, looking back, he saw many of the uh, shortcomings that other people wouldn't even have noticed. For instance, did any of you notice that um, Orson Welles uh, playing uh, Kane, when he comes into the bedroom of um, Susan after she's tried to commit suicide, remember? It's all seen from her point of view and at a distance, and then somebody is knocking at the door and breaking in, and that's Kane. And then uh, there's a close-up of Cain leaning over the bed, right? And he's dressed um, with uh, a coat and shirt, probably a tie, I'm not sure. But anyway, he's fully dressed. I think, yes, he is fully dressed. Uh, in any event, uh, Wells never stopped suffering from the fact that you could see, um, I don't know if it was a watch or a, a uh, you know, a, uh, a bracelet or something that he was wearing that he was ashamed of and that everyone could see it. I never saw it. I never, I never realized it. And even after he, he mentioned that, I, I forget and then I don't pick it up. But it's sort of thing that the filmmaker would himself notice. And there are an indefinite number of those things from the artist's point of view that one would do better if only one could and so on. Uh, this is to amplify the fact that for almost everybody else it's considered one of the greatest films ever made and um, for many people the, the greatest film that's ever made. Uh, Wells uh, made other films that are in many ways better but it certainly is a great film and I thought this would be a good beginning to uh, the philosophy of film and that you'll, you can refer back to it once we have the segment of the course that deals with Orson Welles, right? Um, does anybody want to say anything about the uh, Cocteau film before we get too remote from that? I don't think we had much discussion last time on Beauty and the Beast, and then I'll hand things over to Emily for her 
uh, analysis and interpretation of Citizen Kane. Do um, all of you know the fable, the story? Did you grow up with that? With the Disney version. Of you, the Disney <laughs> version. Well, uh, in my chapter um, on it, I spent a lot of time on the Disney version. Um, maybe we'll have a little time for me to talk about that. But I'd much rather know about what it all meant to you. Uh, when you were a child, this wasn't one of the things that you read or people read to you? Beauty and the Beast? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is one of the most popular. The actual source is a fable written for children in the 18th century by, does anybody know? Uh, a, a French author who was living in England as a, as a governess at the time called Madame Le Prince, one word, uh, de Beaumont. And um, it immediately became a, a great hit in England and in France. <clears throat> there have been later versions it was so famous that people thought it was out of the, coll the collection of, of uh, Mother Goose stories that was written by Charles Perrault uh, in the 17th century, but it was, that was not the case. It was written uh, in the latter part of, or the middle part of the 19th century uh, by Madame Le Prince de, uh, de Beaumont. Um, what uh, Cocteau does is to completely re remodel it and in a funny way almost bringing it up to date because he, he presents it for a modern mentality except that he positions it in the 17th century. Um, you, may, you notice the, uh, the costumes of those of the 17th century and he availed himself of paintings because um, Cocteau is a very important painter, um, more so, I think, than uh, Salvatore Dali, who was sometimes paired with him. But I think he was a more important painter than Dali, uh, and a close friend and devotee of Picasso's, but not the great genius that Picasso was. Uh, the paintings that I'm referring to are those of Femer um, and Rembrandt, which he uses for uh, the scenes in the farmhouse. So there's a use of light on the interiors, in the interiors, the grouping of the men, and they're dressed as if they uh, did come out of the 17th century and could have been part of um, uh, one or another paintings by Femer or um, Rembrandt. Um, so that in that sense, his work is atemporal, as all poetry is. Poetry is really atemporal. Nobody talks that way in any period. And it has a kind of separateness uh, of its own, an unreality even of its own. Um, when to the sessions of, No, I was about, I came, it was in my head, it was right, and then with the, while reciting it in my inferior way, it started coming out. Um, um, it's the lines of Shakespeare uh, about the, the remembrance of things past. When to the, in any event, uh, that, that way of talking is not what people naturally do. Poetry is a kind of music and has its own music. And like what we call music, it is entirely dependent, uh, not, it is dependent uh, on, basically dependent on rhythm. So that uh, just listening to some highly rhythmic, highly rhythmic music, you get the feeling that you get from re reading highly rhythmic poetry. Um, in my car coming up from New Hampshire yes, the day before yesterday, I played uh, a CD of uh, Cole Porter's musical, um, um, Anything Goes. Do you all know that? 
Well, it begins, I mean, the, the overture and refrains throughout begins. Anything goes. Dun, 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 you know, the very strong rhythm with a great emphasis on uh, the brasses, uh, trombones and trumpets in particular. And uh, it's just sort of galvanizing, hypnotic. And it could have been that kind of, it has that kind of feeling of an unreal poetic way of expressing oneself uh, that is very different from the kind of language that we're used to. All right, that being the unreality of, of poetry, a film that is treating its medium, its film, its cinematic medium as poetry, uh, can emancipate itself from particular times and places. Uh, either in the preface to that or one of his other movies, um, um, uh, Cocteau says that film has the virtue of belonging to all places and all times. It isn't limited, and so it feels free to jump back and forth. And it's done in a very poetical way in the movie that you saw. Um, another change that is relevant is the, the male characters, really one character. Do you remember why it's all one? because it's the same actor who plays the Beast, Avenant, and then at the end, Prince Charming. Well, I just had a question. That's OK. Um, is that OK? Go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> at the end of the movie, when we first watched Beauty and the Beast, you gave us a quote, and you told us to think about it. And I wanted to Greta add it. Yeah, and I, okay. I was curious. No, I remember telling you that and wondered whether I should bore you by repeating it. So I'll bore you by repeating it. Uh, Jean Marais was a, a movie idol at, uh, in the late 30s and 40s, and then later, a little later. Um, and um, he, he was what the equivalent of I don't know Mel Gibson or, or uh, who, who, would, who else would be that that kind of movie idol. Um, and he plays all three roles. He also was a very intimate friend of Cocteau's over a period of decades. Uh, Cocteau wrote a book about him. Uh, Cocteau uh, put, used him in several movies. Uh, they were also uh, lovers. Cocteau was homosexual, and I guess Marais must have been, or at least bisexual, but Cocteau was a person who never kept secret the fact of his homosexuality. Uh, in France, it was easier. Other, in other places, it would have been uh, a problem uh, in, for instance, in American or English society. Cocteau just lived that way. It was He was a poet. He could do what he wanted, and he was a homosexual. So he lived and never made any bones about it uh, and talked about uh, Marais openly as this man he loved. Um, now, in the movie, Marais plays an ordinary man, Avenant, who's the man who wants to marry, wants to marry um, Belle. Uh, Belle, and who presumably loves her, except that he's an aggressive male, and uh, uh, he wants to sort of. His first gesture is always to fight for something. So he, he fights with the, the sister. He slaps her. Um, he um, um, wants to go and kill the beast, and then when they get to the pavilion of, of Diana, uh, he has a front reader to smash the glass um, uh, skylight and break in. Not that he's not a very likable person. He's, li he's a little like Bell's brother, who is not at all likable uh, in the role of Avenel. But somehow we also have to see him as a typical heterosexual lover who is in love with Bell, and I think his performance is adequate, though not of, in that sense of Avenel, no, not terrific. Uh, he also plays the Beast, and does it magnificently. I thought that was a great achievement. That the Beast was very well performed. It took him five hours to glue on all of that fur and other stuff that he put on his face, and 
He developed boils and all sorts of things as a result. Uh, but he did a very good acting job, I think. One thing that's especially interesting is that if you know French um, uh, delivery, I mean, the way of speaking, and if you know about the Comédie Française, which is the was you know the, the um, Rolls Royce of French uh, theater life for centuries, uh, and st still is, uh, it's very classical, and it's delivered like most things in the theater, so that everybody can hear it, but also with a kind of uh, obviously artificial cadence, especially since. The lines are often poetic, and, and uh, in the 17th century they had to be poetic uh, for the most part. Um, and uh, therefore, it's interesting that Marais' delivery of the um, beast's way of talking is as if he were on the stage of the. Um, um, the, um, the uh, did I say Academy Francaise? The um, Comedy Francaise. Which did I say? Yeah, of the Comédie Française, uh, and uh, it's not natural. But then why should it be natural? How many beasts have we heard talking good French like that? It's, it's, for me, it's very effective. Some of critics thought it was stagey, but I think, thought it was, that was all right. Uh, it's, his delivery uh, is much less of uh, that sort when he plays the role of Avenant or at the end of Prince Charming. Now, the Prince Charming has to be just that. He has to be princely, and he has to be charming, he has to be captivating, he has to be everything that a wonderful young woman like Belle, who's in many ways very wholesome, would dream of as her uh, lover, as her suitor, the man she'd want to marry. She says in talking to the prince that she loved Avenant, but she continually keeps him off and explains it because of her love for her father. Her love for her father, I think one must take as absolutely sincere and authentic. Girls do love their fathers. You don't have to reduce it to some kind of Freudian uh, concept of uh, uh, incest. They love their fathers. And in the fable, she is a girl who has a true and honest love for her father. And that makes us very sympathetic toward her. She also is willing to risk her life for her father. Um, the um, point is that the Prince Charming, in her imagination, should be somebody who is really very convincing in that role. And Marais, for whatever reason, maybe because um, people nowadays, including me, uh, think of him as homosexual, uh, not really understanding what it is to be a uh, Prince Charming heterosexual, which is what he's supposed to be, it looks to me like a very unconvincing performance. So it's an interesting composite, all of, all of those different kinds of characters being played by one man, doing it superbly in the case of the, the Beast, but not in the case of the Prince Charming. That's where the Greta Garbo story comes in. Uh, the story is that at an early showing of the movie, uh, she leaned over to the person that she was sitting next to at the point where the beast turns into Prince Charming. And she says in her rich uh, voice, she says, give me back the beast. <laughs> and. One can imagine somebody loving the beast the way Belle does, but loving that Prince Charming, that mincing courtier, uh, it's a little hard. Uh, and the dialogue is very interesting at that point, because the prince says, you know, do you think you can love me? And something like that. And she says um, uh, something like, well, I'll have to make the best of it, won't I? Or something like that. It's not wild enthusiasm, except the moment when uh, except actually the answer to that question. She said, uh, uh, when he asked her, did you love this person, Avenel? He, he doesn't name him, that he, uh, proposed marriage w to you. And she says, yes, being honest and sincere. And she says it clearly. Um, and he looks a little depressed and says, well, can you love me? And she looks at him and thinks a moment and 
very short moment, and says, yes. In other words, she'll do this, not half-heartedly, but with a commitment, which is true to her character. And then it's later, uh, she, she says, um, he says something like, uh, will you be able to manage without the beast? And um, he, she says, well, I'll, I'll have to make the best of it, won't I? <laughs> so it's very interestingly nuanced in view of the different male characters and in view of her character. All right, I told you I have a 50-page chapter and I'm ready to go on to its sequel, so I uh, won't continue, though I also I did hope talking about the Disney movie. Um, we have another hour, I think. Should I tell you just a little about the Disney movie? The Disney movie, <coughs> You, uh, draws upon Cocteau's masterpiece in places. Uh, so uh, you remember the chandeliers, the living chandeliers in the hallway of the, of the uh, enchanted castle. Um, you all remember that. Well, in the Disney movie, there is one of the animated characters, because it's all animated, um, who is a candlestick. Yeah. And he has... His name, he has a heavy French accent, uh, as if to remind us of uh, Cocteau's film. And his name is the French word for light, Lumière. So he's Monsieur Lumière, the candlestick. You get it? So there's that kind of cute kind of allegorical uh, reference that uh, runs throughout the Disney movie. But um, it, it um, differs in many ways, and I guess I'd better not go through all of them except one. What is the one thing that uh, Belle wants her father to bring back when he goes thinking that his ship has come in? In a Disney movie or in Cocteau? In, in, um, well, in, in Cocteau, but this uh, suggestion that in Disney, but it's different. But I'm talking about Cocteau. A rose? The rose, right? Uh, do you remember the color of the rose in the Cocteau movie? Is it a white rose? Is it a white rose? Yes, it's a white rose. The roses can be white, they can be yellow, uh, they can be red. And uh, all of these signify something different uh, uh, to uh, the girl you want to marry you, you might send her a dozen red roses. And if they're sort of purplish red, it shows the power of your ardor. Um, the, the rose itself throughout history has often been symbolized for uh, the sexual regions of the female, something that the petals open and something that is uh, beautiful, at least to the male. Um, and um, it, that symbolism happens over and over and over again. Um, a rose, thou art sick, is um, a famous um, poem um, uh, of a pessimistic sort about love, that love brings about death because the rose, either because of whatever reason, uh, is, is, uh, involves a passion that is not desirable to somebody who is infected with sexual love. Um, in any event, the white rose uh, usually means something different, something very pure. So if it's a question of love rather than sex, it's more likely to be white than red. All right, in in uh, Cocteau's film, uh, it's a white rose. Um, in uh, um, uh, Disney's film, it's a red rose. And it's a large red rose. In Cocteau's film, it's a small white rose. Now, Cocteau was making a film in black and white. And so, you know, he might have thought, why, uh, why run any, make any chances of people not realizing that it's red? Uh, and uh, he could have referred to it. There's a movie, Hollywood movie called Jezebel with Betty Davis, you remember? And part of the drama involves her going to the ball uh, in a red 
dress, and you can't tell it's a red dress because it's black and white, but it's referred to as a red dress, and it's shaded a little darker, and so one imagines it's it being a red dress. Cocteau could have done that, but he makes it white, and for me that's important because white signifies the beauty of Belle. She is as uh, sky. She is a, as a, a beautiful, clear, honest, white kind of soul. In Disney, it, the sexual and uh, erotic overtones are magnified. This is being made for a generation in which young girls are very much aware of sex in a way that they were never supposed to be until the uh, middle of, the, or at least until the 20th century. Uh, so that um, uh, a, 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 almost every Disney film emphasizes the sexual dreams and sexual inclinations of young people, particularly the young girls. Um, that become, makes the Red Rose prominent in that movie, whereas in Cocteau it's a different color for a different reason. And that, I try to show the implications of this over a period of pages, so I'll, I think I'd better stop now and let um, Emily take over. Oh, thank you. Um, starting with Citizen Kane, I was really surprised that everyone talks about how you think about the movie so much afterwards, and I couldn't stop myself from thinking about it. Like, it was kind of depressing, so I didn't really want to think about it that much, but. I had to. <laughs> it Let me doesn't interrupt allow. you. Do you want people to interrupt? To make yeah, I would comments? love interruptions. And that's, that's probably what I wanted to talk about because what was really interesting to me was kind of the, interna the interaction of the film with the audience. And so I, I would really appreciate your responses. And um, So one thing I really wanted to talk about was the alienation of the film. And just in the first scene of the film, I thought it was interesting that you come in with the gates and the camera's looking from the outside of the gate, like looking in. And so like already at the premise of the film, you have the camera looking in from the outside. And um, throughout the film, you kind of have this feeling of alienation because you know how in some stories, um, you know what's going on even if some people in the film don't. But in this film, you don't know what's going on either. Like, Do you remember the sign on the, the iron gate? No, I don't. No trespassing? Oh, yeah. Trespassing. No trespassing. That's right. Now, that's supposed to include us as the right. audience. Right. Mm -hmm. And it calls attention to the way in which, as many people have said, uh, there's a voyeuristic element in films, that we're sitting there watching something happening on the screen that doesn't affect us directly, but we're peeping in on. And the many movies capitalize on that. Uh, to take it much further and make that definitive of a film, um, I'm not convinced, but that certainly would be an element. And that's what I think is partly what um, Wells is saying. When you get to my chapter on Wells, you'll see that um, one of the things that define Wells is overall philosophy is, is search for the past. And in this case, we're looking for the past, trying to find out what the life of Hearst was like. And from the very start, we're told, don't, don't think that you're going to succeed. Maybe a person's past, uh, his secret identity is so private and so hidden, given the nature of time and given the nature of the human personality, uh, that you're not going to succeed and you ought to stay out. It's none of your business. There's therefore no trespassing. Yeah. Um, so I found this alienation on many different levels as well. And um, so I felt like the whole film was kind of an investigation for, to find out really who Cain is. And I thought it was interesting, the investigator, we don't ever see him, we just kind of see the back of his head. So it's like, Thompson. We're the investigators. Mr. Thompson. Isn't Mr. It? Thompson, yeah. yeah. Well, the reporter, yeah. Um, so it's like we're him as the audience because we're coming from his perspective on everything. And um, 
So he's just kind of the medium of how we find out things. And I feel like the film didn't have any closure. Like, this really bothered me because we spent the whole film like looking what is Rosebud and all this, and I didn't have any closure at the end, but I think that was a lot of the message that... Um, that we couldn't really understand, even if we tried. Well, we and get a closure in, in the final shots, remember? Yeah, I had a really strong sense of What, what was the, <laughs> the, the, the... Thompson is sent with the mission of finding out what is Rosebud. the meaning of Rosebud. What was Rosebud? Yeah, we found that out. And we, the, the camera is so smart, it zooms in on it, but it takes a little time to get there th until the end of the movie. I kind of wish that... So that that's the closure. Good. That's one closure. It wasn't satisfactory for me, I guess. <laughs> um, incidentally, let me interrupt again. There's one thing I always shudder at. That just before that, there's a group of the uh, uh, crew, uh, and uh, a young woman steps forward out of the group and says, well, Jack, did you ever find out what Rosebud is? Remember? Now, this is a stagey kind of thing. Uh, Wells uh, came from the theater. There would be people on the stage, and you naturally have to have somebody step out in order to deliver lines that can be heard uh, throughout the theater. Uh, and it seems to me to be uh, artificial yeah, a and a kind of setup for him to say, well, uh, maybe uh, nobody ever will know what Rosebud is. And then, then it becomes cinematic again because the camera says, "Oh, wait a minute! I can, I can help, right?" Uh, but that stagey kind of part of it seemed to me to be unfortunate. There are other ways he could have done it. He could have had um, people talking with with Jack instead of being separated the way they are. Jack is on to the right of the screen, and the, the woman and her group are on the left. They could be talking and want to say, no, incidentally, Jack, what was, what did you find out? And, you know, see that, just that posing on the stage uh, could make a big difference. At the same time, Wells was a fanatic about positioning uh, on the stage and the rhythm of different scenes. He worked very hard on this kind of question, just that I think on this one point uh, he may have uh, failed. Um, did you want to say why you felt closure? Uh, just in the very end, uh, I thought it was fun. Um, it just made a lot of sense to me. Um, back to what you said, I didn't, I didn't even think they needed a line. I thought it was sort of implied that no one else had figured it out. Mm -hmm. and, um, maybe if they had just been quiet about it, like I still felt the sense that they weren't sure. But, so it felt tremendously satisfying to me to find out sort of that they, they come out and there's all this clutter and all these things and it's this tiny little rosebud at the end that you never really would, will understand in person. You can, you can look all your life, but it might be yeah. something. So. What was the significance of it being in his childhood's life to you? Um, like, what did that mean? Because I thought about it a lot yeah. in terms of why would his character choose that word? I mean, I guess the obvious thing that for him was like happiness and like being sort of the, the word rosebud? Why that word? Why, 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 when you realize that it's the sleigh at the end of the movie, um, automatically you begin to wonder why would he choose this word and what is Choose it the word rosebud. Would choose the word and choose this object. Well, there is, there is a reason which is outside and beyond the film, um, and that is that this is, of course, the kind of thing no one can ever be sure about. Um, we know that the film was based, at, in part at least, on William Randolph Hearst, who was a great journalistic magnate that, who lived in his castle, San Simeon, um, like, you know, like Xanadu in the case of Citizen Kane, and who wanted to become president, and it was, who, whose life pattern was greatly uh, imitated by Citizen Kane. He had a lifelong companion uh, whom he never married. He had, I think he had at least one other mar wife, but she was his mistress, except that they, they really were married because they lived together for over decades and were very loving to each other, with each other, uh, whose name was Marion Davies. And Marion Davies was 
a wonderfully successful comedian in movies. And you probably haven't heard of her. And I had no idea until a couple of years ago when I saw a documentary on her life how many movies she made how, and starred in and how funny she was and what a re really very, very good actress and comedian uh, she was. You're, this is something that our generation, even my generation, but your generation has no knowledge of, and how devoted she was to uh, William Randolph Hearst. She didn't leave him the way Susan does in the movie. She, she wasn't uh, a wretched creature like Susan in the movie. She didn't have a failed career, which was the result of, uh, of the pressure of William Randolph Hearst, I mean of, uh, of uh, Kane. She had her own career, and at the end, when there were certain financial difficulties, she offered and did give uh, Hearst a million dollars to help him tide him over. She was self-sacrificial, she was loving, uh, and Wells uh, said, af years later, he said, I've re there are things I regret about that movie, one of, one of which was I think we were really unfair to Marion Davies because using her, I mean, having the character of Susan, people would inevitably associate that with her because they could see through the fact that Kane was somehow related to William Randolph Hearst. And that was, and, uh, that was not what she was like. Uh, Hearst was a friend of Wells's father. Hearst knew both of them socially. Uh, I don't know how often, but he, he used to go with all of the movies when he was very just arrived in Hollywood, uh, he used to go with the, all the other, with the real movie stars because he was nobody. He hadn't started then, uh, to to big dinners at the castle, so that he was a part of their society who was who was uh, attacking the society in which he naturally believed. Genius does that. That's uh, he was a tr so to speak what people said about Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a traitor to his class. But that. That's what it is to be a great artist. One has to be a traitor to one's class. Um, and therefore, he regretted having um, put uh, Marion Davis in this, in this position. All right. The reason I go through all of that uh, in relation to the question that you were just, Michelle was just raising is that uh, it was said that among the affectionate love names, nicknames, that uh, the, this loving couple, um, Mary Davies and William Randolph Hearst, had for each other was his calling her Rosebud as a reference to her genital area. Rose meaning things of that sort, as I mentioned earlier. And, this, and he used to call her his little Rosebud, or he used to call it his little Rosebud. You get the idea. Uh, so the, that is one explanation, but if you had, didn't know this, I don't think you would lose out at all on the genius and the greatness of that movie. But that's, in one sense, the meaning of that, why he chose that word. Okay. <laughs> I mentioned this only because you asked for that. <laughs> and without that background um, knowledge, I kind of felt like there was significance in the rosebud because that was the moment in which going with the theme of alienation, that he was alienated from his own life. like, And so that was the big turning point in his life and the point at which, I don't know, I felt like that was where it set up his whole life that he couldn't love, you know, because he was alienated from that environment of, like, right. parents and things like that. So he was, after that, after he was alienated from that, he was incapable of loving other people. He could just want love for himself. Um, there is also the fact that Rosebud, as the uh, icon on a sled, uh, is entirely proper that may have been a brand, even. I'm not sure. But it seems utterly realistic. And if you're going to take a Freudian line, you could say, of course, little boys want to throw themselves on that, on that thing. It's working in their unconscious. They don't know it, but we know, right? I, I don't like, I don't take that line, but uh, that, would be, that would be another explanation of the rosebud, which is the, symbolizes the only time in which 
Cain was ever happy. The ha time in his past to which he's trying to return, but doesn't know how. And that you, you'll be reading much more about that in my chapter on wills. Go ahead. Oh, one other thing. Also, in my, this is something important. Once in my chapter on wills, if you look at the notes at the end, you'll see a uh, reference to a um, kind of introductory textbook on uh, the f nature of film. Uh, see, it, it's not philosophy, in, but it's film theory uh, about the nature of film. And uh, by a man named Gianetti, G-I-A-N-E-T-T-I. -E -T -T and it has a, a kind of general title that you won't have any trouble uh, finding. And in it, there's a chapter at the very end in, devoted entirely to Citizen Kane, where all of the elements of filmmaking that have been analyzed in the earlier chapters are shown to apply there to, uh, magnificently. So, so for a really insightful technical article about Citizen Kane, not just technical, but also the meanings and the and the uh, realism in it. Um, th I recommend that. And you can, if you look at the very end, in the well, actually, you have the book here. Oh no, no, it's the other book. It's it's at the end of the other book. You'll find that uh, that chapter. Go ahead. Okay, I also wanted to talk about the communication with the audience, and I felt like there was hardly any communication because I didn't know what to think. Like, I kept wanting to know what to think about Cain, and I was just like, the whole time I was confused. I thought, at the, at the beginning, you have sympathy for him, and um, you think, and when he's in the young adult stage, you're like, he's all idealistic and everything, so you're, you like him, but then after a while, when he alienates everyone from himself, then you're like, oh, I don't like this guy anymore. So, I don't know, did anyone else feel that, or... What kind of communication from the movie did you feel? I thought um, the way the movie was done was very interesting, actually, in that the beginning they had that movie reel, you know, which sort of gave you the overview of Kane's life and yeah. a little 30 second segment. Almost. Which was modeled on something that was very popular at the time. Uh, in the, it was not, there wasn't television, so it was in the new, uh, uh, newsreels yeah. in the movie houses called The March of Time. And. Um, Wells uh, used to act in that. He used to, I, I mean, his, his voice, because it, it's all about news events, mm -hmm. but his voice was present in a good deal. He was one of the actors in the making of those uh, weekly, or were they monthly, I'm not sure, maybe weekly, um, featurettes called The March of Time, with a voice very much like the one in the movie. Um, in, it would be The March of Time. Um, in the movie, it's changed to uh, time marches on, doesn't it? Something like that. But with the same intonation. So that immediately reminds one of what the people would know f as the march of time. Well, or, I mean, I just thought that... Then go on. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's fine. I mean, I just thought it was interesting because they gave that the little 30-second um, introduction, I guess, to Cain. And then the whole movie is sort of explaining almost this little... You know, more than 30 seconds. Yeah, well, more, like yeah, 10 more than 10 minutes. But that little short segment that gives you sort of the overview of Kane's life, and then the rest of the movie is kind of filling in all of the gaps in that. And I thought it actually really connects with what you're saying about how the audience um, is not actually actively involved in this movie so much as they just have to watch everything happen and pass them yeah, by. And try to figure it out. And try on to their figure own. it out on their own, and really, what is this kind of complex character of Kane? So I thought that was interesting. I don't know if you guys agree. When I was seeing it, it was kind of like sort of like Mar multiple no. layers or plays on reality. Mm -hmm. So it, it was weird because I thought the movie did a huge comment on media and images. Mm -hmm. And images yeah. we see of people in the paper and images in the movie. And images of people, like other people around you see of you. Because really, we're told, we're, when I saw the movie, mm -hmm. I didn't really feel like I got an honest depiction of Kane's life. It was just an honest depiction of Kane's life, like the true picture. Inadequate. Inadequate. In a well, ten minute movie or in the larger movie? In the, uh, in the movie. In the, oh, in the whole movie. Mostly because his life is told from the perspective of different people. Mm -hmm. So it's all slanted towards like what people saw of him. And even when he's in the newspaper, you know, people see him in the newspaper, it's sort of like the same thing. 
when you're seeking the newspaper, your ideas are slanted by what people are saying. So that's why I was kind of depressed at the end, because... You mean, well, this is very interesting, but you mean it wasn't his life seen from his perspective? Right. It was seen, not even from his perspective, but his life, period, mm -hmm. no matter who's seeing it. You know what I mean? I didn't feel like I was an omniscient viewer just watching. I felt like, like I was told journalist. what happened. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm a journalist. that's how I felt. And I thought it was ironic because the whole movie Kane is a journalist. Mm -hmm. And it's like these journalists are telling you about Kane. Um, in that sense, the movie is not sympathetic. And Wells himself was not sympathetic with the character of Kane. He thought he was a nasty individual. So in a sense, it's almost like uh, uh, a kind of debunking of a public figure. But I actually thought it was a little sympathetic because the beginning felt very real. You know, when you see his house and how scary it looks. Because before, I didn't know it was just like a castle that he made up. I thought it was actually real. And so there's something very depressing about his life when you see the beginning. It's something very sad and sympathetic, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, but well, it's sad you mean, in, in a way that makes you sympathetic? Mm -hmm. Or the presentation is sad that somebody should have wanted to make such an unsympathetic movie? No, I think it was, like, made me feel sympathy for it. Oh, you did feel sympathy. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the end of the movie, in the beginning, I felt sympathy. As the movie went on, I didn't. But at the end, I was just—I felt more sympathy because you have this man who everybody pretty much hates at the end, but we really don't know how he's feeling deep inside. We just know what happened, all these events that happened, but how he really feels is still unclear. And with the whole Rosebud slave thing, I think that added another dimension. You know, for a grown man to remember his sled is, you know, something very interesting. I think that one of the reasons that you can feel sympathy for him, even though you see that he's become something of a monster, is because he has this remarkable hubris that's brought about by the fact that he's a man who, later in life, seems to see himself as something of a god. Mm -hmm. He thinks that he can change people, warp people. He, for example, in the scene where he's, or the, the part of the movie where he's making the quote singer into a real singer. Mm -hmm. he th he's going to do this not by. I mean, he'll build her an opera house. He'll get her a coach. Yes, he can't. Yeah. He can't make. He can't make her good. But what he can do is he can change. He can change reality by writing a good editorial about her. And he her thinks image. that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly. He thinks that he can change. He's he's going to play God and he's going to change reality from what it actually is through his writings and through his photography and whatever else. Mm -hmm. There's the scene where he tears up the paper in which he has promised to be a servant to the people, and, and then and in doing so he becomes sort of, a, he thinks of himself as a god over the people, the and, and, and then he moves himself, he builds himself this garden of Eden, this heaven on earth, a paradise for a god, and then it's, it's, this, it's this whole hubris issue that, that, that builds itself up because you know that inside he's not a god, inside he's an insecure little boy, and that's I think why he says Rosebud, because he longs for that time when he knew what he was, and he, you know, he, when he, when, he knows that he's not a god, and he longs for the time when he was just able to be a regular mortal. Um, he's boyish when he's young. He's not boyish later on. And he's a little boy in the sense that uh, he's failed to overcome whatever happened when he was young that explains his later arrogance and willfulness. That's true. Um, many political figures are like that, I think. And so. Wells, who was very much involved in politics, um, and even wrote uh, uh, um, political speeches for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, oh, as you'll be seeing the um, by, the um, documentary about it. Uh, he he was uh, Roosevelt suggested he run for senator of Wisconsin, where he was born. Um, you'll you'll find out all, a lot about that. Uh, he understood, he understood what it was to manipulate people, and he understood political realities. He's a tragic figure himself because he was rejected by Hollywood for all the wrong reasons, and he never could somehow bring out what uh, was deepest in himself, which was his desire to make movies. Uh, in that documentary, you'll, you'll, you'll see he says that, uh, at this point, two years before he dies, he said, you know, I think I uh, made a wrong choice in 
going into movie making. Uh, it consists in 98% in hustling and only 2% making movies, you know, hustling for money. Um, then he says, so I think maybe I should have done something else. And he could have been, and he was a writer, he was a painter, he was a musician, uh, he was a very famous actor on stage in his, his movies on, in the film and in many other movies. Uh, he was a world figure. He was known by millions of people, uh, not merely for as a director, but for all these other things. And then he says, but you know, I, I stayed with it. it. It's like the man who says, I really shouldn't have continued living with that woman I was married to. But I did it because I loved her. <laughs> Which is very funny, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's because he loves movie making, even though it was a mistake, <laughs> that he went on and did it. And his life is tragic in that way. Um, well, I shouldn't prejudge you, but after at least one or two students who watched the documentary, which is a marvelous thing to see um, in this class, said to me as I was walking out afterwards, they said, you know, it's so sad. <laughs> I mean, here was this great man, this genius, who is now more famous than he ever was before, um, but uh, somehow uh, failed. Uh, he was lamenting the way Hollywood and the other powers in filmmaking were treating him toward the end of his life to a friend. And the friend said, oh, well, you know, you, in, in the future you will, will be recognized. And Wells said, oh, yes, they'll love me in 40 years. Well, it hasn't been 40 years. He died in 1985, so let's say 25 years later, he was becoming this cult figure. If you go on the internet, you'll see all the clubs and all of, all the uh, uh, letters and everything about this great American genius, but a, 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 a sad one. And instead of writing about himself that way, and why should he? He was 25 years old when he made Sit in the Game. He writes it about a failure of a typical American sort of the previous generation, the same generation as his father, who was a, a tragic figure of a different sort. I think one of the reasons why that is, and I think that's something that runs parallel in a lot of composers' lives and a lot of artists' life, is that their artistry doesn't fall into the social norm of art. Mm -hmm. And so they're not accepted, but then later, because they're on the cutting edge, so when finally society kind of reaches to that point, then they're appreciated later. And I think that's something that runs throughout different forms of art. So. No. Um. no, it's always better not to be an artist, but to be the heir of a great man. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so another thing I wanted to talk about was, and I don't know very much about this, what was kind of the filmography, or the, I don't know, the cinematography, okay. Um, but I wanted to think about how the cinematography contributed to the meaning of the film. Because I know, like, it is said that he was kind of on the cutting edge of cinematography for his time, but how did that add to the meaning of the film? Or was it just like cutting edge in general? Anyone want to say anything about that? I don't know. Um, Wells had been involved in the uh, invasion of the world, the War of the Worlds scare and scandal in 1938 uh, on radio. And so he, he was on the headlines, first page of the New York Times and all around the world because of that when he was 23. So Hollywood grabbed him and gave him a contract at the age of 25 uh, of an unheard of sort that nobody either before or after had. He had a great deal of money to do exactly what he wanted without any control from the studio to make a movie of any sort he wanted. All right, so being a writer, he wrote the screenplay, but he hadn't made movies and he didn't know how to make movies. He said at that time, when he arrived in Hollywood and stayed here almost a year, sort of feeling his way around, um, he used to watch John Ford westerns. And one great 
example of that is Stagecoach. I don't know how many of you know that movie. He watched it 40 times, <coughs> but uh, he couldn't figure it out why the Indians come from one direction some of the times and another direction. The, the camera work troubled him. And just by chance, um, somebody came to see him. And it was Greg Toland, G-R-E-G-G-T-O-L-A-N-D, uh, who was the most sought-after sought and, ta and perhaps most talented uh, <laughs> cinematographers in Hollywood at the time, a man of very great talent. And he said to Wells, I want to make this movie for you. And Wells said, but I don't know how to make a movie. And Toland said, that's why I want to make it with you. <laughs> All right, so they get on the set, and uh, they collaborate closely. And um, uh, at one time, uh, Toland says, look, um, you, you're doing everything wrong. Um, come back to my apartment with me, and I'll teach you all you need to know in three hours. Um, so they shut, shut down the movie that day, and they go to an apartment, and Tolan, Tolan gives some instruction on cinematography. And Wells said that was all he ever needed. The story may be a, a little fanciful, maybe it was four hours, but more or less that's what happened. Uh, but it happened because he had with him this great man uh, in cinematography, Greg Tolan. Um, so one of the things I was thinking about with the cinematography was the transition of the scenes and how that contributed to the meaning. And I think a large part of this movie was you had sort of the investigation in present day, and then but you were constantly flipping back in time and not necessarily in chronological order no, either. Back and, and forth. Back and forth. So it's kind of a confusion of reality, but. The, the thing is that when they went back in time, it wasn't like an imagined thing, like this was actual clips of what happened, and I think that was interesting. So in some way, it is reality, even though you're hearing it from like second hand through other people. And um, so yeah. I think of it as being influenced, actually I haven't written it, you've given me this idea. Uh, the influence of cubism in painting, uh, Brock for instance, uh, in which you might have a painting, let's say it's a realistic painting, or in the case of the, of the movies, it's time seen spatially as a linear progression. And like in cubism, you cut up the, the painting, the units, and you sort of jumble them in any way you want, maybe randomly. And that's what cubism is. It takes a three-dimensional object and presents it in ways that we don't ever see from any dimension, but it's all of which pertain to that object. Well, that's in a sense what um, Wells does here uh, with the, um, the, the cell, uh, celluloid. You know, you can imagine it all have, have been printed out in the usual linear fashion, and then he cuts it up and restitches them. Um, and um, I, uh, that's very much like Hughes, and it works with him. Wells used to say that um, the least important part of filmmaking is the actual filming. The most important part is the editing, and it's true. You often spend weeks on a movie and, then, and months um, editing it, and in the editing it, you cut up the strips and reorganize them. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone else has anything else they want to say about the cinematography, but um, I don't know, something that really bothered me, and this is random, was how they portrayed the aging of people, because yeah. it was just so unreal that it really bothered me, because I really wanted to, the whole film to be real, I guess, well, really, and it was, it really bothered, bothered me, because oh. it looked so fake. Mm -hmm. Really, with the makeup? Yeah, know? with the makeup. Oh, <laughs> anyway, that was just a side note. Well, I so, thought yeah. how artful it was that this 25-year-old boy, you know, because I'm so much older, uh, could appear as 25 years old at the beginning when he starts the the newspaper, remember, um, and then ends up being maybe around 70 or 75, and really looks like that a man of that age, with the drooping of his skin and all the rest that happens with age. And to the extent they did it, it was impressive, but 
I don't know. I think they do a lot better job now, so I'm just used to that. Or something. But, I don't know. They did, unless they had to put in an awful lot of time. I think. Yeah. I, I think he mentioned somewhere the makeup job in, in being two hours, four hours for every every scene. So that was basically what I had on Citizen Kane, and then I don't know. Can we talk about the reading just a bit? No. Yeah, why don't we now go on to? Uh, uh, either the preparation for the Purple Rose of Cairo or the chapter that leads into it. Right. Um, so I just wanted to open up the discussion about what we think fantasy is, if that's possible. Well, that's a big question. Well, I know, I know, but I think we have to think about it before we get other people's opinions and, you know. Well, the Purple Rose of Cairo is, is a movie <laughs> of fantasy. Right. Of course, one doesn't ordinarily see uh, actors coming out of the screen, right? Yeah. So we can have fantasy on something that is against the laws of this world, I guess, or we can have something in fantasy just as it's not truth. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, let me take my uh, roll call of people who have seen the movie, have read the chapter on it, on the Purple Rose of Cairo, which was assigned for today, and um, I'll, I'm not interested in names, so I cover my eyes. Emily, could you tell me, include yourself in the roll call? Okay. How, how many, many have read it? How many have read up to okay, date? Are up to date have... in the reading, which includes the chapter on the Purple Rose of Cairo. Okay. How many people have read the chapter? That's right. Wait. Uh, Only three. Is that right? I think um, five. Oh, five. That's a little better. Five out of uh, eight, right? Is that oh, six. I'm telling myself. I'm sorry. Six out of eight. Well, that's all right. In general, you should, uh, unless we rearrange the program so that you see the movie first and then read about it. But as of now, that, that's a good sign. Um, uh, Margo? Yeah, I actually thought it was weird to read it before seeing it, because I was kind of reluctant to read well, do we have, can we leave that to next time instead of, because we only have a couple of minutes now. Okay. Okay. So for next time, you're going to be uh, uh, reading about Death in Venice. No, no, do you get that? The introduction. Oh. That, that's the movie we're going to watch next week, Death in Venice. But what do you read for next time? I think the same, the next chapter, because this reading is on the Purple Rose of Cairo. And, the, well, there are two chapters related to you know, 127 where what where is 127 that is death in venice. so for next time you read uh, the chapter on death in venice and the chapter that leads into it that deals with the relationship with the liter uh, uh, relationship between the literary and the visual and on the basis of that uh, you understand the point of view of my analysis of the movie, but you will not have seen the movie. Um, that's, that is the problem that we have to address. Um, maybe we can do it now? I don't know just uh, how, to, how to do it. I'm worried that you're going to spoil the movie by giving away key. I'm worried you're going to spoil the movie for us by giving away key plot elements before we see it. Well, the point is the, my chapters on the movie are so analytical. The, yeah. You could think of them as helping you to perceive what's going on as a kind of introduction. That was, that was my idea. Uh, spoiling it, I, I don't know. We have to run that risk. Yeah, it's both good and bad. I don't uh, think about things. In other years, I've sometimes had people read the Thomas Mann novel called Death in Venice as a preliminary and then see the movie and then read my, my thing. But that, we didn't have enough time for that this, this year. How many of you know the Thomas Mann? Okay. So, well, it'll come back to you. Why don't we, why don't we proceed as planned? Um, read, read it all. And um, somebody who's going to give the presentation? Susan got her hand up. What? Yeah. You haven't okay. done so yet? Okay, um, I, and, and could you please watch the movie first? If you go to the film office and tell uh, Doug, who runs things, that uh, I said it would be all right 
because uh, you're giving a presentation, he'll surely let you have it. Okay. Uh, it's something that you can find in any number of libraries. I don't know where at MIT there is another. Uh, in fact, no, no, until next week, I think you as a student can borrow it from the film office, which is 14 and 428, and be sure to return it in time for the class, that's all. Uh, what we, we wanted a little time to talk about uh, the pur Purple Rose. Well, if you want to leave that till next week, that's fine. If no, the reason I uh, wanted the head count, we have only about three minutes now, is to see how, what ideas you had about my chapter on appearance and reality, which is fairly long and maybe complex. Um, it, you've all read that by now, and you're more or less clear about that. The idea is that you will also go back and read things over or skim in, in order to clarify your own thinking. Um, it's not a question of memorizing it, but being able to get ideas of your own, so you go back and forth. Uh, and um, the um, chapter on the Purple Rose of Cairo is, uh, makes sense only in that context. It illustrates the problem about appearance reality which is discussed explicitly in the previous chapter. You'll see that, um, obviously, and those of you who have read the chapter on Woody Allen are already aware of it, but seeing it in the movie will make a difference. And my hope is that having read what I wrote about it, you'll see the movie better. Let's, let's go on that hope for the time being at least. Um, and the same will be true next week when you read the chapters on um, the visual and the literary and also the one on Death in Venice. The movie will make much more sense for you. All right, and um, we're all set about the presentation. I don't think I have anything urgent to say, okay. except it's a very wonderful, rich comedy. So just sit down, sit back, and enjoy it. But if, in in your enjoyment, you could allow some of the ideas that I was making penetrate, you may find you don't agree with me, which is great, or you may find that you do agree with me, which might be of some utility, and um, it'll it'll be different than if it weren't in, in this context. All right, should we go to do that now? Who, who's gonna, who's gonna do it? Put it in. Anybody want to? Thank you.